Okay, so I'm Marissa Kasame from University of Utah. Today, I'm gonna talk about my work on membalancer, which set the heap limit for garbage collected poem language. So let's play a game. Let's open your laptop. You are gonna use, I bet that you are gonna use a web browser. Maybe it's Firefox or Chrome or Safari, doesn't matter. How much memory is your web browser using? Oh, oh my God, for me, it's using two gigabyte. Remember that we used to make fun of Emacs for being for using eight megabytes and it's constantly swapping. This is 250 times worse. It's horrible. And it's, it's even more horrible for mobile phone. Because on mobile phone, we have even less memory. So let's try to fix this. If we do some profiling, we'll find out that half of the memory go to the JavaScript heap. So if we want to make web browser faster, we have to start by making JavaScript use less memory. Okay, so what does JavaScript do? Every, uh, here we are plotting the memory consumption of a JavaScript program. As you can see, we, every, the blue line is constantly taking upward and this means the allocator is allocating stuff. And every once in a while, there will be a sharp drop in that. There will be a sharp drop in the graph, and it represents a garbage collection. So, if we do more garbage collection, we will be saving more memory. But it turns out that garbage collection is a trade-off. If we do more garbage collection, we will be saving memory, but we will be spending more time running a garbage collector. On the other hand, if we do less garbage collection, we'll be using more memory, but we'll be spending less time garbage collection. Let's try to visualize this. Let's say we are running Twitter. And let's say we are garbage collecting very infrequently. Then it will use lots of space and little time. We can also flip it around, make it garbage collect very frequently. Then we'll use little space with lots of time. If we take all the garbage collection frequency and we plot that on this graph, we'll get a curve which represents all the space time trade-off we can make. And we call this, and we call this curve the space time trade-off curve. Okay, so it seems like whatever we do, so it seems like no point on this curve is better than another point. It either uses more memory or it uses more time than another point. So are we done? Can we do better? The point of the talk is there's work to be do, done here. Okay, so the trick is we are not running Twitter on a program and nothing on a laptop and nothing else. Maybe we are also looking at news and running CNN. Then we'll have two space-time trade-off curve. And let's say we are run, running the, we are making Twitter garbage collect very infrequently and making CNN garbage collect very frequently. Then we'll have a point for Twitter that uses lots of space but little time and another point for CNN that uses little space but lots of time. And we can add the two point up to get the, the total resource consumption of our system. It will use both lots of space and lots of time. But we can make Twitter garbage collect a bit more frequently and CNN garbage collect a bit less frequently. When we do this, they will both use a moderate amount of space and time. And when we add the two point up, we're gonna get a new total point that is gonna use both less space and less time than the original point. So it's a real improvement. So the rest of the talk, we're gonna try to find this better point.
Okay, so it's gonna be structured into four parts. Part zero, I'm gonna build a mathematical model of garbage collection, and I'm gonna solve it to get an, to get an optimal solution. Part one, I'm gonna compare my solution with what other people do. And part two, we're gonna actually try to implement the thing. Then part three, we're gonna do some evaluation. Okay, let's start by building a mathematical model. At here, we are, we are having a memory consumption plot. Basically, we are gonna be running a program and we want to plot how much memory it's using over its lifetime. Let's say the program is in steady state. It will have a life memory of L. And it, will, and it will have a heap limit of M. That means when the program reach the heap limit M, it will do a garbage collection and free up all the non-life memory, which is M minus L. That is our extra memory. And when our program is running, let's say it's gonna be allocating object at a constant speed of G. Then it will take M minus L over G amount of time before it have to do a garbage collection. If we flip this equation around, we'll get the garbage collection frequency G over M minus L. Once it does a, once it reach the heap limit, it have to do a garbage collection. The bottleneck of garbage collection is interesting the life, the life memory. Let's say it does so at a speed of s. Then it will take l over s amount of time to traverse life memory. So we have a two formula: the garbage collection frequency g over m minus l and the garbage collection time, L over S. If we multiply the two terms together, we'll get the garbage collection over heap, given, a single, given the heap limit for a single program. But we are running multiple programs at the same time. So we want to minimize the sum of all the garbage collection overhead with the constraint that the sum of all memory limit add up to a constant. This constant represents the total amount of memory we are able or are willing to give to all the JavaScript program in your laptop. If we solve this equation, we'll find out that we should set the heap limit to life memory plus extra memory proportional to the square root of life memory. And this is our core, our core solution. Our equation also depends on G and S. See the paper for more detail. Okay, so that's our optimal solution. Now let's see what everyone else does. It turns out, basically everyone else choose the heap limit rule, m equal life memory plus extra memory proportional to life memory. This means they're using a linear rule. And comparing to them, we give more memory to a smaller heap and less memory to a larger heap. This means we are using a sublinear rule. This sublinearity reflect the idea of diminishing marginal return in economics. Think about it this way. Suppose you have a small heap. You can give it a larger K because it won't be using much memory. But if you have a big heap and you try to give it a large K, it will go out of memory. Since the idea of diminishing marginal return is so fundamental, other people have realized this and they're trying to twist their garbage collector to reflect this idea. For example, in Firefox, the developer have some code that try to detect whether the heap is small, is medium, or is large. 
And they also have code that detect whether the heap is allocating object quickly or slowly. Then it will try to assign a different case according to the three times two equal to six case. If you think about it, they are just approximating a, a square root function with a piecewise linear function. So why don't they just use a result at directly? And if they do that, they will get rid of instability and bimodality problem at the condition of the switch case. So that's, so that's what the state of the art do. Now let's try to actually implement our work. Okay, so we implement our work in V8, the JavaScript engine for Chromium. The V8 garbage collector is very complex. It's generational, incremental, concurrent and parallel. It has cross-component garbage collection and idle time garbage collection. Don't worry if you don't really get it. To be honest, I don't really get it either. But what matters is we can handle all the complication one by one. For example, the V8 garbage collector is generational. So we only set the heap limit for the old generation. And we take the allocation rate to be the rate object get, get promoted from the old generation to the young generation from the young generation to the old generation. Once we've done this, it's as if V8 is not generational at all. We can deal with all the comp complications one by one in a similar modular manner. And in total, we, we implement our works in 200 line of code. And most of those line of code is spent measuring G and S. And here's one fun thing we discover when we are doing our works. So V8 has this subcomponent called idle time garbage collection. Basically, it's trying to use a complex state machine to detect when a program is going idle, which means it's not allocating object any is allocating object at a very slow speed, and it will trigger a garbage collection to clean up the garbage. It turns out using a state machine to do this isn't a great fit. Sometimes the state machine miss, uh, miss, a garbage, miss an idle time, and sometimes it miss fire idle time garbage collection. But it turns out when we measure G and S with smoothing, we, auto we automatically detect idleness in program and then we will fire idle time garbage collection at the right time and not misfire. In total, we removed 250 lines of idle time garbage collection code since we already does their work but better. And this 250 line of code is more code we remove than more code we add. And keep in mind, we are adding a code, we are adding a code not to do idle time GC. This is, this is purely an accident. Okay, so that's our implementation in V8. Now let's see some evaluation. Uh, so, we, we, so we evaluate our work on six popular websites out there, Fox News, CNN, ESPN, Gmail, Twitter and Facebook. Every point on this graph is an experiment. The black point is the baseline and the green point is us. As you can see, the green point are to the left or to the bottom of the black point. This means we are either saving space or saving time. There are also green points that is both to the left and to the bottom of the black point. Point. And this means we are saving both space and time at the same time. So we are, so we are making a real improvement. On the other hand, there are no point to the right and to the top of the black point. And this means we are not regressing. 
If we do some statistics, we will find out that we, on average, we are saving 16% of memory for V8. And keep in mind, this 16% memory saved is 16% memory in a critical component of form that is, that is used by 3 billion people and is known for being, and is known for using lots of memory. Okay, since this work is so simple yet significant, I want this to be implemented in all garbage collector out there. So I've talked to the Firefox people. They have implemented our work in Firefox and it makes the Firefox garbage collector 20% faster. Matthew Flat also implemented our work in Racket in the afternoon and it saves 10% of mem Racket's memory. Our work for V8 is also currently under pull request and it will be hopefully deployed soon, so you guys will get to use it. There's also ongoing effort for Python, Go, and JVM. If you maintain a garbage collector and want to improve, come talk to me after the talk. We'll figure out how to get it to deployed for your language. Okay, so that is mem balancer. It set heap limit to be live memory plus extra memory proportional to the square root of live memory, not proportional to live memory. That is wrong. If you do that, it will reduce memory consumption and garbage collection time. Come talk to me to get this implemented in your language. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Okay, hi. So uh, I, I think I basically get, get the idea that you mainly focus on uh, old or full heap GCs. And yes. but, but, but most modern garbage collectors are kind of generational and they usually start GC earlier when the heap is not full. Yes. Yes, so but, but, but the, I mean, the nursery GC also costs in, in, in terms of time, right? So, so is it possible that you apply your model to the generational GC? so that the, the, the nursery space can also be ad adjusted to uh, like um, optimal size as well? Uh, we are working on this right now. Uh, okay, thanks. Hi, um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. So um, when you were driving your formula, you kind of assumed that you would get the total of a memory usage by summing the maximum heap sizes of all the different instances. But you actually, can, if you can control the scheduling of garbage collection, you could avoid having to make that pessimistic assumption, right? Because you, you, wouldn't, you could avoid having the maximum heap size be all at the same time. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say? I sort of understand what you're saying. Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, sorry. Um, you made the assumption that, that the maximum memory usage will be the sum of the maximum heap sizes of all the instances. Yes. But maybe you can avoid having each instance use all its memory at exactly the same moment, and so yes, you, your yes. mem then your maximum memory usage will be lower? Yes. Can this you do is, that? I think this is possible, but keep in mind this is in a web browser setting, and when you do this, you need communication across tab, which is potentially a security problem. Um, so your thing, if I understand correctly, it's based on the assumption that you've got multiple programs running independently but sharing memory, basically. Yes. What if you just had one giant program running on the entirety of the hardware? Um, I can't think of a great example right now, but you know, if something could happen, wouldn't your stuff actually be applicable in that situation? Yes, uh, we get this question every time. Basically, the answer is yes, because the computer has lots of cash. For example, your computer, your operating system keep file cache and swap. And when you're using too much memory, they will be cleared. Your, your JIT compiler also keep co-vector run, and maybe your program itself has some domain-specific cache, and they will be adaptively cleared out if you use too much memory. So even if you're running one program at one time, the program is made up of many components, which all have this space time trade off. Thanks. 
Um, my question is that it seems like you assume the um, life memory is kind of also independent with the maximum heap size you said, but in practice that um, some programs might keep their internal cache or, or in Java you might have soft references that yes. might affect your actual life. <coughs> Uh, have a thought of that? Yes, uh, we haven't thought about this, but Emery Berger has a paper in Uppsala that talk about how garbage collection can interact with can interact with cache. I think it's a great read and it's very relevant to this topics. Thank you for your talk. Um, so you showed that there are already quite a lot of uh, engines adopting it. Did you notice any specific difference? So typically language implementers will have specific opinions, how they adapted your approach. Uh, I couldn't hear you, can you repeat again? So how did the language implementers that adapted your approach actually maybe slightly modify it to make it feasible in their engines? Yes, so it turns out, let's go back to this slide. So it turns out racket doesn't measure G and S. Matthew Flat tried to measure them, but it turns out it doesn't do any good. And Python uses reference counting, so we are sort of working on how to fit our things on to reference counting, but I don't think there's any fundamental barrier. So all in all, I think it can be adapted to a different language. Right, for the systems with tracing GCs, uh, did you notice that they kind of adapt the things they measure, the formula they use, or yes. do they exactly copy what you have in the paper? Uh, each one of them will, I think the key insight of the formula. is the square root. So mm. you should definitely have a square root in your formula but you could probably trick other part of the formula. Like maybe you could give different threads, different rate. Maybe a program is more important than you give a higher C or K. So you can do that kind of things. Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions for Marissa? Then let's thank him again.